Welcome to episode 130 of the Necronama.com. I am James Sabata, horror author, screenwriter, co-host of the podcast you're listening to right now. And no matter what this episode tries to teach you, we cannot build you a girlfriend. And I'm Don Guillory, author, historian, educator, co-host of this podcast. And, uh, you know, when I was younger and watching movies like Weird Science, I often thought about what it would be like to build my girlfriend of the future. Uh, and then I grew up and realized that is a horrible idea for many reasons. Seems like it would be, yes. I was going to build a guest today, but I thought instead we'd just call one of our friends. So Brian Haas is back on the show. Brian, thank you for coming back. Yeah, well, welcome. yeah uh, glad to be here. Um, we get to talk about one of my favorite movies, so uh, always uh, happy to join you guys and listen to you guys bicker like an old married couple. So <laughs> There was only like 15 minutes of that before we started recording. Well, no big deal. Uh, you know, it didn't take. So... <laughs> So uh, you've been on a few times. You were actually our first guest on the show ever when you did Terminator and Terminator 2. We're going to come back to that in a second. Okay. And you did Creep Show 1 and 2. Yeah. Also, that was one one episode as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We didn't we didn't understand downloads back then or else that would have been four episodes, right? Uh, and, yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, you did Spontaneous, which is one of the best movies I saw this year. And I thank you so much for that. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and you had a special guest appearance on uh, Shelley Grant's episode where we talked about Parasite as well. Oh, that's true. I was a, a special um, a guest. Um, I piped in like right at the end or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> One of the best recording sessions I've ever had. Awesome. Anyway, um, so I want you to uh, tell our listeners a bit about yourself in case they haven't heard your your past episodes. And then I want to jump in. And just kind of talk about the theory that, um, you know, sequels are always worse because I know you don't feel that way. So you have the floor, my man. Yeah. So um, I'm James Sabata, a horror author and screenwriter. Um, no, fuck. I fucked that up. I'm sorry. I'm Don. Get, no, I fucked it up again. Um, I'm Brian Haas. Uh, I am a... A uh, film programmer at Film Bar here in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I am the producer and uh, co-host of the BS Movies podcast. Um, I've been a film critic for, <clears throat> God, very, very long time, since the last century. Um, so, you know, I've uh, been around movies for quite a while now and, and seen quite a few. And um, I've seen more than... Uh, one or two sequels for sure that's that's for certain so definitely yeah but yeah so that was kind of my thing like you like it's not like we planned this it was like two and a half years ago but you uh mm. your first two appearances you did movies one and two yeah terminator one and two creep show one and two yeah. and uh i would argue that i mean i know you're gonna argue this as well but terminator two obviously one of the best sequels ever. Oh, yeah. 100 mm -hmm. times better than the first movie. Yeah. Creep Show 2, I think there's parts of it that are better than the first one. Um, the two kind of cancel each other out for me because I would want to take pieces from each. But yeah. um, do you want to just talk about that, that whole sequels are always terrible and just how you feel about that and any sequels that you think are amazing comparatively? Oh, yeah. I mean, what a ridiculous notion. It's, there's no sequels that are better. Um, there are plenty of sequels that are better. Um, the movie that we're going to talk about today is, I think, light years better than the original. In the Absolutely. original, in the original, is considered to be a very good movie. You know, so it's not like we're talking about, oh, you know, it, it just you know was popular with the folks and then it got a good sequel or something like that. No, there's plenty of good sequels. Um, I, I don't buy that at all. Um, to be honest with you, I didn't really like any of the Fast and the Furious movies until we got to like five or six, probably, you know. So, I mean, like, um, I think a series can start off bad and get into good sequels, you mm -hmm. know, like it's it's uh, it's crazy. Um, but no, there's plenty of uh, sequels that I can think of 
um, that are better. You had already mentioned um, Terminator 2, which I think is a very obvious choice. Um, I'm a big fan of Aliens over Alien, um, and I know that might be a little bit of a controversial choice, um, but like, I feel like Alien is a very good haunted house movie. I feel like Aliens is like an, a, you know, like an action masterpiece. Um, so, I mean, it's almost like not even comparing the same movie, but hey, it's a sequel, right? You know, so like that's uh, the, the whole idea behind it. Um, and like there are uh, plenty of um, franchises that I, you know, like I really like some of the sequels, um, even some of the long and the tooth ones like Friday the 13th. I can tell you I like, you know, part six. I like part 10, you know, like um there are late uh, versions of the Chucky series that I love. Mm -hmm. I, I think Chucky's been so oh, yeah. true, to be honest with you. Um, like, I don't think that it, the quality's ever dipped. Um, and then that's really kind of saying something. Um, and so, like, I feel like it maybe happens in horror more often because, like, in horror, you get, if you make something that's popular, you get more money the next time so you can, you know, gloss over some of <laughs> the problems that you had with the original yep. you didn't like about it um but i think that you know like rolls over like uh you know there's many people i sort of like them the same but like there's many people that will say godfather 2 over godfather you know and i don't i find it hard to argue you know like um you know it's first sequel to ever win a, an oscar for best picture so um the notion that sequels can't be good is stupid I mean, that's just ridiculous. Um, but there's plenty of ones that make you think, oh, man, you know, like the, the Matrix is a good example of that, of where you're just like, are they even make like are, this is the same team that made the first one? <laughs> <laughs> that is quite a drop off, you know? So, yeah. I think uh, two of my go to's, I, I always talk Saw 2. And, and my reason is it's not that Saw 1 is bad. It's that Saw 2 did a totally different thing. And I think if you had just brought in two more people and kind of followed the same formula, which is usually what happens with some horror, mm -hmm. nobody would care about Saw at all. And, uh, and, and there's a lot of people that hate Saw, and there's crazy people like me that love it. But a lot of us always come back to Saw 2 and how it was this totally different thing, and that's mm -hmm. what refreshed it. And when you talk about Terminator 2, it's a totally different thing. Or aliens um but also the other one that i wanted to mention is gremlins i don't necessarily think two is better but i think two is just fucking nuts and it's okay. a fun movie on its own because it's different like yeah. like we didn't just rehash gremlins you know what i'm saying right yeah totally um i mean yeah i think that's a, a great example um and um we would have never had the uh the skit on Key and Peel of like, you know, <laughs> what if we had a gremlin made of lightning? It's in the movie, you know. It's like we were never Paul Hogan in the movie, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, Don, what do you have? What what uh, sequels do you prefer? You two mentioned some of my favorite ones, but there's also The Dark Knight. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, definitely. And the other one I would think of just off the top of my head would be Thor Ragnarok. I didn't really care for the first Thor, but I love Thor Ragnarok uh, yeah. as opposed as opposed to Thor and Thor Dark World. Because, uh, I mean, if, if you got Taika Waititi involved, it's going to be good. Like there's going to be a great mix of horror. I'm sorry, of, of humor and action uh, or even in the in the case of what we do in the shadows, you've got a good mix of horror and comedy. Um uh, uh, because he he just knows how to to merge genres so well. Even with Jojo Rabbit, I mean, you've got uh, a comedy war film. Yeah. And I'm still hoping for a Jojo Rabbit too, but set in the U.S. I <laughs> <laughs> <We might> get it. <laughs> so, um, so Brian, uh, yeah. when I sent out the list, you yeah. jumped directly on this one. You were like, "That's the one I want." <laughs> oh yeah, and. And you told me this is one of your favorite films. What is it about Bride of Frankenstein that speaks to you so much? Uh, I mean, it's one of the most iconic icons in the history of cinema, um, the, the reveal of the bride. Um, I literally have 
I don't know, half a dozen works of art that I've commissioned of different artists, like just, you know, like recreating that sort of piece um, in different styles. I have like oh, that's one. awesome. Yeah, I have one that's like uh, Dia de la Muerta, you know, like with the sugar skull, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, you know, I got like it's and you get like whatever flavor, you know, that that particular artist has or whatever. Um, but um, it was the first horror sequel ever. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I would say that um, it's definitely better than the original. Um, oh, yes. And it's for sure like one of the first dark darkly comedic movies right um like this one um you know i often say that this is a horror comedy you know um because of just all of the circumstances that happen in this um i mean it's a little fantastical and ridiculous um at times um but like um i really like the way that they kind of sneak the social commentary into this you know um and it's it feels so relevant to like this last couple of weeks where you're just like, God damn it. We're not like any further than we were than this. It feels uh -huh. like, yeah. you know, um, like the autonomy of a woman's body is being decided by either a brute or an intellectual and they're both fucking wrong, you know, and it's like, Jesus Christ. Um, and does the woman get a say in like her fate whatsoever? No, not, not at all. Uh, so yeah, um, there's just a lot of different things that I really love about this movie. Um, and, um, you know, there's not a wasted minute of this movie either. That's one of no. the things I really love about the movies then. And you're starting to see a resurgence of it now, right? Yes. I've seen more like 75 minute movies in the last five years than I've seen in the you know, 40 years prior to that, you know, that I've been watching movies and I'm so happy about this trend because it's just like, I don't know if like this generation of filmmakers that's coming up is just like, we're going to tell the story and that's it. Right. We're not going to, you know, put an extra 10 minutes of fluff in there so that we can make sure that it, um, you know, hashes out to a, a commercial airing schedule or some shit like mm -hmm. that. That's why 90 minutes was the perfect time is you know you could plug it into any slot you know on television and then put a bunch of commercials in it and yep. you don't miss a second of the movie but you can still sell 30 minutes of commercial time and so um now with that not being you know with the whole dynamic of that being changed now like nobody really cares about that extra 10 minutes or 12 minutes or whatever so like if the story is 75 minutes and the story is 75 minutes and this story is 75 minutes there's even like a little bit, there's even a smidgen of filler right at the beginning that is probably not, I'd like the, the exposition at the very beginning is the one thing that I would just be like, eh, do we really need this? You know, but like, that's, I, I'm totally willing to look past that and um, just enjoy the whole rest of everything that comes after it. So I'm, I'm such a fan of the insanity of Lord Byron that anytime he's on screen, I'm fine with it. I'm just <laughs> yeah. like, People need to know how weird this dude was, you know, but uh, no, going to what you were saying about 75 minute movies. We talk about this in, in author world all the time because novellas have gotten so huge in horror world again, and everybody's kind of pushing that way. And it's great because you, you keep that story tight and in horror, you need that, that grasp on your reader or your viewer or whatever. You have to keep them on the edge of their seat. So when you're adding filler, to meet word counts or meet uh, script page counts or TV time or whatever, you lose that because everybody knows we're just killing time until we can get to stuff. Mm -hmm. And and so that's one of my favorite things that's come from streaming is yeah. that now we're just like, like you have shows that like one episode's 45 minutes and the next is an hour and 15. And I yeah. love that there's no fucking consistency because that's what the story needs. Yep. Love it. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I'm just like, tell the story, you know, and like whatever the story is. And like, if you can legitimately tell a three hour story and keep me captivated and there's plenty of people that can, I've certainly seen them. Um, then, you know, you can do that. Right. Um, but like, this is, this is a theme that we revisit a lot on my podcast. Um, you know, like every minute over 90 minutes 
has to be earned in a movie, right? You have to earn that time, right? It's not yeah. just give you. And to be honest with you, I'm going to want to, you know, like cut time out of your movie. Like, this is another thing that I say all the time. I was like, I can cut 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes out of every Hollywood movie and make it so much better. Just make it tighter, you know, and just you know, without losing anything, right? Without just losing superfluous, stupid nonsense. Um, that's just, like you said, it's just filler. And like, there's no, there's no call for it and there's no need for it. And it sort of drives me up the wall. And I really love these new directors now that are, you know, I, I think it is very much like streaming, like you said, because like, there's just no rules anymore. And so if you want to make a three hour movie, um, I just saw a really great one. Um, it was a documentary about like a folk horror called uh, Woodland Tales um, that I would definitely recommend. It'll be coming out in November. Um, so I don't know when these are coming out in October. So um, yeah. yeah. So um, you know, like a couple of weeks after this podcast drops, um, this movie will be dropping and it's, it's fascinating. Right. And like, it's three hours long and I was captivated like every second, it could have been like two more hours long and I would have fucking eaten up every second of it. Right. But that's because it was so engaging. Right. And mm -hmm. it was just completely captivating my attention. I didn't pick up my phone. Right. I was watching this, you know, through a film festival at my house and, um, you know, that's how I can tell when, like, the festival movie is not really going up the snuff is like, you know, uh, better, uh, let's, let's see what's going on on Twitter or something, you know. Uh-huh. Yep. How once did I do that with this? But, like, that is because it completely, like, captivated me um, versus, like, there's plenty of 90-minute movies where I'm just, like, I'm losing steam at, like, right. the... 60 minute mark you know i'm just like there's been uh, there's already been too much here that we should be getting to the resolution already at this point and well, or yeah. or that or that moment's at the beginning and it's yeah. like i can't get into this because you dragged out 20 minutes when we should have jumped in over here right exactly yeah you you started the movie at the wrong point yeah i mean it happens a lot um and so like you know i i feel like you know for a movie if you're going to even have like that beginning part. And I think this is where a lot of people actually cut, you know, there is like, they just say, fuck that, you know, prologue shit. Um, you know, the five or seven minutes that I'm going to have before the credits roll or whatever, I'm just going to start it with the credits and then we're going to go right into the story. Um, mm -hmm. but like, you better have an exclamation point where it's like, I am grabbing your attention um, with that little like stinger at the very beginning of the movie. Cause otherwise I'm going to immediately be like, do you even know what you're doing? Right? Like how much are you invested in like keeping this tight and like moving in the right direction as opposed to, you know, just meeting criteria. Are you trying to put like a beer commercial in here or some shit like that? We <laughs> cut shit out, right. I'll, I'll tell you where to cut it out. That should literally that should be my job. If Hollywood was smart, they would hire me to cut ten minutes out of every fucking movie, and they would fucking love me for it. But what about that? <laughs> I will send you all of my scripts to cut ten to twenty minutes out of, I'll and do it. I will pay you in like uh, a single beer. I don't know. I don't have money. So <laughs> spooky squirrels or something, maybe. There you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I think that you you hit so much stuff just now that is just like things that I complain about that I feel uh, the mainstream people, I don't, I don't know what else to call them, don't even think about. Like, like, I don't think anybody's thinking, oh, this action movie should be told faster. Maybe I'm totally wrong. But like, I never hear that from other people. But I always hear it from horror people. It's they lost me. I got bored. This happened, you know, like. Uh, so, so you watch a million genres and I watch what I can fit in into my schedule. So my question to you is, do you think this is an overarching problem that people are paying attention to? Not, not just being a problem. Like, do you hear it in other genres as well or not? I don't think people are so in tune, like in like other genres. So this is what I always keep telling people about horror is like, we are a self-sustaining community, right? There are no um, drama conventions that people go to. I mean, I mean maybe there are, I'm, but like, I don't know. That sounds that. horrible. Right, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. 
they, they all they all bring like you know um, their problems and then they all fight you know like passive aggressively. That's a drama uh, convention, maybe. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean like you have film festivals, right? Where it's just we're showing films and like, and I guarantee you, every film festival, if it's not genre based, has a genre piece because they know it sells. And so, um, but if you look around, like at the conventions and how we support like our actors and stuff, like none of the horror actors go hungry, right? Like there's probably Never. some drama actor from the seventies that is like, you know, has three, uh, saltine crackers to their name and like would die to have anybody recognize them. Whereas like, you know, like. So we wheel these people out until they're almost in the graves. Uh, and I can tell you that from experience because I've seen a few of them that were almost in the grave and it's, but we love them so much and we support them. And um, so like, I think it's more in tune because the audience is more in tune uh, as opposed to like when you just get sort of broad where it's just like, you know, not people are just not really sort of paying attention. I don't think. Hmm. What about you, Don? Do you see it a lot at all or not? Or as far as the 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 length of the films being yeah, like like troublesome? are people like, oh man, MCU movies are too long, or like like just anything. I'm just using that to make well, it easy. Well, yeah. I think with with different <laughs> genres, it it the length of a film can work, uh, especially when you talk. You know, you mentioned MCU stuff, so you're looking at an hour 45 and it almost seems like two hours is almost the standard with, with the Marvel movies. Right. Yeah. Um, but even with the ones, cause I, I just saw, you know, the, the most recent one and it didn't drag on. And when we were done, I'm like, Oh my God, that movie was two hours. I didn't even notice mm -hmm. because they kept your attention the entire time, either with a really cool action scene or a car chase or, uh, even some of the storytelling itself. Um, the, the I, I think probably the one thing that people complain with those movies is just having to wait through the the, the credits <laughs> to see whatever else is extra. <laughs> but um, but with horror, yeah, there there's there are movies that work well um, within the time that they're given, right? And there are other movies where we can all differ on this one. But there are other movies where we look at it and say they could have made this shorter, they could have made it longer. I felt as though they dragged it out. Uh, which this is not, you know, anything against slow burn movies where if if it were something like um, gosh, uh, Hereditary, mm -hmm. the first time I saw it, I felt it was too long of a movie. The second time I saw it, I felt it was just right. Mm -hmm. Now, the subsequent times I've seen it, I'm like, shit, they could have put more into this. They could have actually had a little bit more time and, and given me like 10 more minutes. And there could have been something something else there that really helped drive the story. Um, and I think what it really comes down to is seeing a movie from different perspectives helps to determine how you're going to see how the time gets used in those films where, you know, we, we mentioned Godfather, Godfather two earlier. I don't know of anybody who's complained about the, the three hour runtime for Godfather or even no. Godfather two, uh, because they, they keep you, they keep you entertained and they keep your attention tuned into the story uh, as well as the characters themselves. But there, there are definitely some movies that, that could benefit from a shorter runtime. I don't think this movie would benefit from a shorter runtime, uh, given that it's been roughly what, 87 years, 86 years since, since it came out. Um, I, I think it would benefit from a little bit more time as far as, having us having more screen time with the actual bride um, as opposed to everyone else's stories uh, being told, or at least everyone else uh, driving the story up to the point where, you know, the, the bride is created and we've got like three minutes where we have the bride, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. No, uh, that's uh, my gripe has always been about this is that we did need, and, you know, like maybe that was intentional. I, I don't know. Um, but um, and maybe that's why the this, this scene where she's revealed is so iconic is because they do sort of like tease it the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, but 
I, I would have liked more time with the bride for sure. Um, I just like, it's one of my favorite characters ever in the history of like movies. Um, and her, you know, literal, like, like you said, 180 seconds of like hissing at people, you know, and I'm just like, God, I love this character so much. Like I, I can't even do, describe it. Um, she definitely fits into my, um, my type of like uh, bitchy brunettes, you know, I'm just, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, Elsa, um, Lanchester is, uh, really quite good looking, you know, um, and like continued to act forever. Like, um, you know, that's one of the things that I really liked about her is, um, you know, some of these people, they have like a short, career uh, especially like in this time frame you know where it's like the mid to late 30s or even early 40s you know a lot of those people just like you know the studio system just chewed them up and spit them out and uh, she hung around for for a long time well we actually get to see her as herself basically because she it's plays her. mary shelley at the beginning yeah, yeah and uh and it's so different that like I didn't even notice it for years. I know. know? Yeah, like, I didn't know it for the longest time. Uh, I thought it, I was like, why is this? You know, I was like, well, I get why they do. Cause they're just like, uh, the idea of a horror sequel was brand spanking new. So they're just like, Oh yeah, the story wasn't done yet. And they're like, Oh yeah, that's a good idea. The story wasn't done yet. Cause look at all those dollars that we raked in for Frankenstein. Um, and so like, you know, clearly this is done. Uh, for monetary reasons, um, mm-hmm. and yet it turns out to be just so, so much better, um, which is crazy because, like, you know, the turnaround on it's really quick, and um, like uh, it's kind of funny because Karloff was a little more, um, you know, he had a little, he had a little pull at this point, you know, like at that point there weren't really many big, big movie stars, and Karloff was like recognizable. Um, and so like he, you know, was very angry that he didn't get any lines in the first movie. Um, and that, um, you know, the, uh, the prosthetic was very like, um, difficult to wear and like, it just Mm -hmm. hurt his head when he was wearing it and stuff. Um, and see, so he had much more say in this, um, in this sequel, which is why he, you know, the monster speaks in this. Cause like he, the monster speaks in Mary Shelley's book. Yeah. Uh, right. right. Um, and like Karloff was actually always kind of hurt because he's like, but the mom, you know, he's got that great voice, you know, he's like, but the monster speaks and, you know, and it's like, um, so yeah, um, I, I do love the fact that he gets to shine a little bit more and kind of show that he is a very charismatic actor because like he is, cause like the Frankenstein is nothing without Boris Karloff. Like, I mean, Mike, um, it's all, it is, it's it teeters on the edge of bad, right? Like mm-hmm. I, I don't like to, you know, talk ill of the Universal monsters because I love them so. But but Frankenstein does teeter on the edge of bad. It really does. Um, and oh, like, yeah. cartoony and silly and stupid. Um, and if it's not for the empathy of, of Karloff, I don't think that, that movie works at all. So hey, you know, by all means, you know, in the studio system, you won't, you don't have much, um, you know, pull anyway. So, you know, get your pull in anywhere that you can, Boris Karloff, man. I, I, I feel for you. And then it's my understanding that Elsa came up with the bird movements for the bride. Do you know if that's true or not? Uh, yeah, I thought, I think that is something that I've read as well, um, where it was just sort of like the really stark like neck movements so that it just made it feel very unnatural right like um something that is just like it's scared it doesn't know what's going on Mm -hmm. and like everything is terrifying um and so um i mean i don't think she gets nearly the credit um that she deserves for this movie because like it really is i mean everybody thinks of that seen at the very end of the movie and like it's literally it's like a hundred or a hundred it's like um you know 70 like 70 minutes of build-up to get to that you know before we even get to see her so it's yeah I mean, it's, 
No, totally. I, uh, I honestly thought she would be in it way more because in my mind, I remember those scenes so much Mm -hmm. that, that I thought they were stretched out more. And I was like, I literally finished it and I was like, wait, what, huh? (laughs) Like, did I miss something? Do I have a version that cuts something? Yeah, go ahead. No, I was gonna say it's because it's because she's become such a or that character has become such a big part of culture, right? To where I'm sorry, the part has become bigger within our culture than the part was in the movie. Oh, sure. To where we all collectively remember the bride being in the film a lot more than she actually is in the film. Um, through the way it's portrayed in cartoons, the way it's parodied in 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 sitcoms and uh, and, and other movies, things like that, the, you know, the costumes, all these things that have gone on to, to further incorporate her into monster culture or just horror culture in general. It makes it seem as though she was much bigger or had a much bigger role than she actually had in the film or the presence that she had in the film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, I, I also really like, um, like I said, sort of the the body autonomy stuff um, that is it's super subtle. Um, but, you know, like you got to think of the time period, right? Like 1935, mm-hmm. there are six years past women getting the vote. Right. So like um, this very much. I mean, like, God, is that not a great analogy for, um, you know, women being involved in the process? And just, I I mean, we can only imagine what it was like, but I'm sure people were not great people back then either, you know, Um, and in fact, I'm quite sure of it, Uh, (laughs) quite sure they were not um, as, um, you know, we like to think of things as being terrible all the time, and sometimes they are kind of terrible all the time, but like, we also have to sort of look at like the, the progress that's been made, and there has been progress that's been made, and it's it's not enough and it's like infuriating for lots of different reasons for many different, you know, minorities and, um, you know, genders and sexualities and, you know, all of those things. Um, but like all of this stuff is brand spanking new in 1935. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, they must feel like, I mean, it could have very well been an analogy for like, I don't know what the two pul- the two parties were that they were just sort of flipped at that point. Right. But it was just, you know, like I'm sure it was very similar to today where, you know, it's brutes on one side and intellectuals on the other side. And nobody seems to really be taking the considerations of like the people that are affected, you know, like shouldn't they be a part of this conversation maybe um, instead of, you know, like looking, like you said, looking like a bird back and forth between the two. Where it's and like hissing at both because fuck both of these assholes. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I, I think that that's a very sort of uh, sly way to sort of uh, move a little bit of social commentary in there, um, where uh, you know, because like there's no real precedence for this particular character. I mean, this is not something that's mentioned in the book or anything like that. The whole idea of like the horror sequel is pretty. I mean, like I said, it's brand spanking new for this movie. I mean, this is the first time ever. And so, like, they're just like, well, fuck, how do we continue this? Like, we killed everybody at the end of the last one. It's just like, oh, let's just put a, like, just kidding. You know, JK, you know, right? (laughs) Um, And uh, it turns out everybody, like, almost died. You know, it was all, it was very dramatic. I'll give you that. Yes, the windmill burned down and everybody almost (laughs) died. But But it turned out that it was fine. Everybody was fine anyway. Um, and now we can continue on this story and like, it could have just been like, this is the continuing adventures of Boris Karloff, you know, and he probably would have preferred that to be honest, you know, uh, if it would have just been Frankenstein's monster instead of the bride of Frankenstein, again, he's not given any credit, you know, cause he is not Frankenstein and he is not the bride. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I just always think about some of those things and wonder how much like gender politics played in the making of these movies. Cause like Hollywood's always been, you know, 
a little ahead of the curve. They still have obviously very big problems and, you know, those need to be addressed. But like, as far as like the idea of like equality and, and things of those natures, it, it you're, they seem to be on board with that. But, you know, like you can see with like the actions that have come through, especially, you know, in the last few years here with all the stuff that's come out, um, you know, it, it seems like, yes, things have come forward, but we've also like totally failed the women in our lives, you know, um, from this like predatory thing that happened there. And, you know, to be honest, really just happens everywhere uh, all the time. Uh, you know, like I, I told Shelly, you know, there's this movie lucky and I, I told Shelly I was watching it and I'm just like, I'm really blown away by it. And I told her, I was like, this finally kind of shows me a horror that I can never understand the horror of being a woman. Right. You know, just like the everyday horror of being a woman. And like, it's, it's like terrifying, you know, and it's like, and you feel so bad that we've failed so poorly, you know? Um, and you know, you feel that way about a lot of different things, but like, um, you know, it feels like, uh, we've certainly let the women down a lot for like a lot of different reasons. Uh, and I think this sort of like speaks to that a little bit because like she is not treated well, she's not given like any say in the matter. And then somebody else decides her fate at the end. So, and I think I think if because you had a few examples of of women breaking through and and having a little bit more of say, um, and the one that always comes to mind is Mae West, but even she was held back by you know the some studio executives and the censors things like that, um, as far as what she wanted to put in her, into her movies. Yeah. Um. So I kind of question if if. If Mae West had produced this film or had been instrumental in this film, like how how different would it have been? I mean, would we have had which they would have cut it because they cut it in one of Mae West movies? Yeah. Would we have had the 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 bride like kill Doctor Frankenstein and, and uh, Doctor Pretorius, um, or would they? You know, would she and and the monster have gotten together and, and killed everybody and and ruled this and and lived in the town in peace? Or would she have, uh, would, would the bride have basically said, which even then we have to look at it this way, the bride, we're already assigning her, I mean, because of the title of the film, right. we're assigning her a relation, which doesn't make sense because right. of the way that we talk about Dr. Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster. <laughs> right. So, well, she's, she's technically be, his bride because he made her. Well, he didn't, he didn't make her. Never mind. Yeah. yeah, but it's, 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 it's still like one of those things that, I guess the movie companies themselves are trying trying to take advantage of the confusion that people had over the story Frankenstein to where it's Frankenstein is the big guy with the bolts in his neck. It's not the doctor who's actually right. named Frankenstein. <laughs> Yo, I don't yeah. even think it's that much thought. I think it's just, hey, we made like what did what did Thomas say on the last episode? Like a quarter of a billion dollars. Right. Or some shit like like, yeah, yeah. like we made this much money. We have to have Frankenstein in the title so that people go back. Well, you could look at it this way, too, because I, I, I don't know why I didn't think about this before. But if you've got a creation, right, it's supposed to take your name unless you name it. So if we have, you know, Henry Ford, his vehicles were Fords, mm -hmm. you know, and you had a specific model for each one. So mm -hmm. it, 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 it makes sense that we would call the monster Frankenstein as well because it was his creation. He yeah. doesn't tell us what his name is. He doesn't have yeah. one. Uh, yeah, Frankenstein's monster makes sense. Um, you know, the, if they were um, like a little more um, spicy back then, maybe they could have called it like Frankenstein creates woman, you know, or something like that. Um, which still has, you know, obviously like troubling overtones, <laughs> but still, <you laughs> yeah, know, whatever, you know, it's. <laughs> Uh, I, I think um, Gory Corey said it very well. She's like, as long as you know that there's these troubling overtones to it, it it's fine. You know, like you you're not like endorsing those things and you know that they're problematic, but you can still enjoy this thing. So because um, otherwise, you know, like we could I mean, it'd be impossible to enjoy any of these sorts of things, probably. I, I think that sums it up really well. So once again, Gory Corey is smarter than I will ever be.
All right. You, you both of you mentioned this, 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 and this is what I wanted to get to was the whole mm-hmm. horror comedy aspect of this, um, which it might not have been that way in 35 when the film came out, but looking at it with a 2020, 2021 lens, or just even a lens of the late 20th, early 20, uh, late 20th, early 21st century lens. Mm-hmm. The whole movie is funny. Oh, yeah. It, 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 starting with, you know, Maria's father going to the to the windmill and like, I need to see his body. I need to make sure he's dead. Yeah. Then he gets killed. Then his wife gets killed. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, Minnie's like, the monster! The monster's alive! And she's warning everybody. And they're like, oh, you crazy old lady. She's like, well, I warned you. <laughs> yep. and you just have to laugh because you're kind of like I I almost feel this almost feels as though Mel Brooks was sitting there like hey what you need to do is add a little humor to this movie <laughs> and yes. I, I swear I feel as though he took Minnie and created Frau Blucher based off of her oh it's 100% Frau just, Blucher yeah just, just from the look just from the look of her and the way that she acts and the way that she talks back and and just just the way she 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 carries the scenes that she's in whether she was meant to or not it's it's remarkable at how funny she is and how funny the scenes are without her having to be funny mm-hmm. it's just it, it almost seems so natural as far as like i'm trying to warn you guys that there's this crazy you know the, the monster is still alive oh whatever you crazy old lady you know what fuck you guys i tried to tell you if any That's of you right. gets killed gets eaten it's your fault That's uh, right. it's, it's like jaws i mean <laughs> We need yeah. to close the beach. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you didn't close the beach. And you reelected that mayor, and he's still the mayor in Jaws 2. So there's your uh, lesson for Jaws 2. Don't reelect people that keep the beach open when great whites eat your tourists. You hear that, Texas? Yeah, exactly. And That's Florida. A, that is a very good analogy. And Mississippi. And, and Alabama. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I, I said this on the Frankenstein episode, but again, we're recording these like a month out and I'm terrified to see if the news is even worse at that point. So oh, yeah. I, just, I just want listeners to understand if our if our comments are completely outdated and you're like, oh, they got rid of that shit. What are they what? talking about? You know? Let me what? tell you something, James. <laughs> I've, I've lived in the South the majority of my life. Yeah, no. these will not be outdated. By the time oh, this airs, yeah. these will uh, not I'm, be outdated. I'm worried they'll be outdated in the opposite direction. <laughs> like, uh, there's a horse that, in the hospital. We are like, way past the, that. Good old days before <laughs> Handmaid's Tale. Remember that? Oh, man. <laughs> I remember those days. Uh, no, yeah, I worry about that a lot, too. Um, especially when I'm, uh, you know, doing something ahead of time like this. Um, yeah, sorry we're giving everybody a peek behind the curtain of, uh, you know, how podcasts work. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, we don't sit around and, like, record a goddamn podcast every week. I mean, we sometimes we do. Um, but, you know, most of the time it's like we line some shit up, we record a bunch of podcasts, and then we, you know, line them up for, like, you know, release later or whatever. Um, and so that's why, you know, people ask me, they're like, why are you talking about a movie that's eight fucking weeks old on your podcast? And I'm like, cause I recorded that shit two fucking months ago, you know, and right. uh, it was a brand new goddamn movie when I was talking about it. So, you know, like, well, that probably works well for you cause you watch things before they're released as well. So then yeah. you could talk about them and then release them on release date that way. Uh, well, I actually uh, do actually kind of work it out sometimes um ahead of time so that you know like that's why i was asking you know like when these were getting uh, dropped because you know yeah. then the november thing you know um that was something that shelly finally like she finally got it this year where she's just like oh i get it now and i'm like all right sweet now we're both on the same page so like we can you know because i'm always like planning stuff six eight weeks out you know and uh she, she would always be like why are you talking about Halloween movies in August. And I'm like, oh, well, <laughs> because. Uh, <laughs> it's a good reason for that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, that's that's why they don't shoot movies that they're going to release in Hol- um, on Halloween in Hollywood in October. They shoot that shit in January, and then it's ready in October when they need to release it. So, sorry, I'm, I'm giving all the looks behind the curtains <laughs> today. This I have somebody a f- listening and they're like, what? <laughs> this ruins like, the magic. I know, right? I'm sorry, people. I'm sorry that I'm ruining the magic. 
I, uh, I have a friend that lives in Vancouver and she always like posts, it'll be like July and August and she'll be like, they're taping another, uh, Christmas special for lifetime, you know, <laughs> and like post pictures of their freak fake snow and stuff. And that always cracks me up because it's always July and August. Yeah. Um, so I, I have this idea that we should shoot, um, lifetime Christmas movies here in Phoenix and we could do it year round and just set up like, you know, two or three houses that, uh, you know, have like the de- decorations out front and it doesn't matter. Um, what time of year it is because like it's always going to look the exact same in Arizona. So it's always Arizona Christmas, you know, at lifetime movies. So I, I don't know. You can crank them out like, you know, in 10 days. That, that's all I'm saying. Well, and that goes back to what you were saying about the bride of Frankenstein earlier. There was a rush to get this done. Oh yeah. And, and movies now like, you know, they're, they're better. <laughs> scheduled and and so i look at how good this is and i can't help but think this is kind of pulling in everything we've talked about i can't help but think that part of having such a rush schedule is saying karloff what do you want to do with the character elsa Mm -hmm. what do you want to do with the character and you're outsourcing it in a way but you're doing it with the people who are going to be that so you know it works and and even movies now like when you let george clooney overtake a script like uh Leatherheads. He did amazing with overtaking the script on Leatherheads. Mm -hmm. Like when you let these people who are going to play these parts do the things that's going to make it more real. Yeah, it it just works. Um, You know, I'm a huge wrestling fan. So giving somebody bullet points and letting them be the character, I, I, I view it the same way. If you're saying Elsa, bring the bride to life. Yeah, you're saving time and you're getting shit done and we're getting a movie that held up almost a hundred fucking years. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, I, I think really it sort of necessitated getting out of the artist's way. And, um, you know, a lot of times that's a recipe for failure. Right. Mm-hmm. And and for whatever reason, it worked really well in this instance. And I don't know if that's just because like they had a really strong core of like the same people because it's very similar cast and, um, you know, the production crew and stuff like that. Um, you know, is there's a lot of holdovers. So, you know, um, I talked to, um, some other filmmakers earlier today and they talked a little bit about the shorthand that you have when you, um, you, you've worked with somebody before. Um, you know, I'd made the point that like when you're looking at like production partners for making movies, you I mean, it's stupid to look at a production partner for one movie. You want to look for somebody that you want to continue to make movies with for like a sustained period of time. And that's the reason why Scorsese always works with the same people. Tarantino mm. always works with the same people because they know. Right. And they don't have to tell anybody anything. It's just like, all right. Everybody jump into your position. Let's fucking do this thing. Uh, right. And, um, you know, I think there's a little bit of that in this and a little bit of just like, you know, maybe they got lucky. I think luck is definitely like plays a little bit of part in this. Um, oh, yeah. You know, because it's just sort of like, where do we go from here? You know, I, like to me, this was probably one of those like Corman-esque things where they're just like, the bride of Frankenstein, you know, that's what universal just came to James Whale and said, the bride of Frankenstein. He's like, all right, let's do it. You know? And like, they just sort of gave him carte blanche to do whatever the fuck he wanted. Cause they're just like, your movie just made a shit ton of money. I don't fucking care to just make something, you know? And, um, I think that's kind of what happened here. And they wanted to take the silly edge of it off a little bit and so they made it a little bit funny you know and um carlos got like more of a say this time um and because you know like in the original uh, colin clive is uh lead build in the original movie if believe it or not um and carlos finally got um over the title billing uh in this movie because he was a fucking star like i cannot really describe you know he was like Clooney you know he was like that level um Mm -hmm. and uh you know like media was different then so like there wasn't a thousand different points of light that are like you know drawing your attention different directions it's like if you're a fucking star in the 1930s 
everybody knows who you are. And so like he'd gotten that, you know, and like he continued to utilize that and, you know, make movies throughout the entire uh, rest of his career. And everybody always says Boris, Boris Karloff was very nice and, you know, didn't really let it get to his head. And, you know, everybody had nice things to say about him and stuff. Um, but like, I think this, you know, him saying, I, I want a little bit more in this. Um, and like, everybody just probably going, yeah, that seems fine. You know, like, what do we care? <laughs> it worked the last time. Let's, yeah, let's do a little bit more of that. Um, and then we can work in whatever, you know, but yeah, I feel like this is a, the title came first movie. I a hundred percent believe that. I, I agree. And, uh, I made this comment last week on the Frankenstein episode, but I really feel like the beginning of, Oh my God, he's alive was literally somebody just going, I don't know. He was in a fucking hole or something. He's fine. Move on. Exactly. You know, like, <laughs> and yeah, I, I truly things. believe that he fell down like, did the we... goddamn windmill. It's goddamn fine. You know? Did we kill him in the last movie? No. Okay. That's exactly. They did it. They did it. The comic book in wrestler style. Did you yes. see him die? <laughs> then he's not dead. Exactly. And it's even if like... you did see him die, he still might not be dead. So exactly. yeah, it's like a retirement yeah, match. He'll be yeah. back. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've said my piece on uh, the bride at this point. And um, as I'm looking at it here, I think we're creeping up on like 75 minutes on this. I don't know. I'm not keeping a hundred percent track of that, but what <laughs> I really like is for this to be a, a special feature on uh, a future episode of, uh, or a future uh, release of like a, um, you know, the 8K cleanup of uh, Bride of Franken, because, you know, why not? You know, we'll just keep cleaning it up. You can't clean it up anymore. You know, like the human eye can't even see the differentiation between, you know, <laughs> the, the things now. But, yeah, we'll keep cleaning them up, and it'll be great. So, yeah, thank you for listening to this um, special <laughs> feature on the 8K version of uh, Bride of Franken. <laughs> That's awesome. It's true, though. Like, it holds up. Uh, I mean, obviously, with the cleanups and everything, like, it looks great. I was this Dracula, the first Frankenstein. Like, I was amazed at how well these clean up and like still work. And mm -hmm. like, you know, you kind of I went in. I haven't seen any of them in years. And I was like, yeah. oh, man, is this going to be rough? And no, not at all. No. And here's the reason why. Right. OK, because like everybody talks about, you know, like these cleanups for all these different movies and like, oh, my God, we had to get the film elements out of a barn in Oklahoma. And it was underneath 10 pounds of pig shit. I can't even fucking tell you <laughs> like how terrible this like restoration was. Right. It was in a hole. It's fine. Exactly. Yeah. It was, it was in a hole. It was fine. Exactly. Yeah. Move on. Jesus Christ. Why are we still talking about this? Um <laughs> people cared about these movies, right? Whereas people did not care about a lot of those other movies, you know? Um, and like, we still love these movies. Um, and they continued to get played over and over again. And so they never really got, you know, like universal would just keep striking prints of like all of these movies because they kept playing, you know, and it was like the old days, you know, there is no video store. So like, Hey, why not roll out Frankenstein every, you know, five, eight, ten years? Because like there's a whole new audience of kids that haven't seen it yet. And it's a totally fine movie for them. Um, and that's the real reason why some of the Universal Monster movies are like so well preserved. Whereas like a lot of the other film elements for like these other films are like gone or destroyed or like very badly damaged. Um, because like nobody cared about them the way that they cared about the Frankenstein monster. So like, go ahead and tell me what a garbage fucking genre horror is one more time, please. Because, like, my shit still looks pristine a hundred fucking years later. Um, how does your shit look? You know, <laughs> probably not as good. That makes so much sense. I've never thought of it that way. I really, I appreciate that. That made me, it, it I, just really, like, it really accentuates how important these films were at the time and how important they've been every single decade since. Yeah. I love the history of film, you know, like I just love history in general, but like, I love the history of film and uh, the preservation of film has been especially interesting to me 
um, you know, like programming films and stuff like that, because like you get to see the painstaking, um, you know, things that like people go through. Like I talked recently to um, a uh, like distributor. I mean, they do a lot of different stuff, um, but they did a cleanup of like um, George Romero's like lost film, you know, and like they said, it was literally sitting at like the Kiwanis club in like Pittsburgh or some shit like that. You know, that's like where they found the film elements for this thing. Wow. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, wow. That's yeah. It's crazy. Right. Um, And he was talking about how like it was nearly impossible because like they, they didn't know if they had like enough of the original material in like, he talked how painstaking, you know, the process was and stuff like that. And this is like somebody that everybody agrees was a very important filmmaker um, who like had a widely beloved like filmography and is like relatively modern. Right. And we're still not saving his shit. Right. So like, you know, what chance does this stuff have from like a hundred years ago? So like anytime that I hear about that or, you know, like every time somebody says they found, um the the phantom i i always forget the name of the the movie that lon cheney made the fan the phantom of london or something like the something like that mm-hmm. um it's a famous lost movie you know and it's um got like um just sort of this famous like um crooked teeth grin you know of like this monster that he played um and like it's one of the the grail the holy grails of like lost movies um and like we probably will never see it, you know? And like, again, you know, an a artist who was beloved, uh, an artist who's like filmography was like, uh, very well received. And like, you know, was one of the, in his time, like Lon Chaney, Lon Chaney senior was as big of a star as they, there ever was, you know, um, because of like his dedication to what he did. Um, and so, um, like any time that I hear about any of the preservation stuff, it's always very interesting to me. And so that's why some of these things, you know, like uh, I tried to do a screening of Ferris Bueller where I want to do I want to do 35 millimeter. Right. Because I've never done a 35 millimeter screening before. And that's how I watched films when I was a kid. I want to do it so very badly. You think Ferris Bueller, very easy one to do. Right. No, like they, they came back to me and they're like, well. We got we got three copies of it and they're all beat to shit. And I'm like, you don't have a good fucking copy of 35 millimeter Ferris Bueller's Day Off, like a, a, a film that everybody agrees is like a classic movie. Like, you know, and so all of this stuff, you know, like I I really worry about it. And like I hear some of these preservation people that like talk about it and I'm like. I mean, like they're they're absolutely right. And we're going to lose a lot of stuff that is just not recoverable. Um, and it's going to and the, the weird thing is because technology is going so fast, there's going to be a lot of different technologies that this is caught on. So, like, we're going to have to, like, think of this in terms of like 12 different formats, probably from, you know, like 1918 to uh, probably the eighties or something like that. And even then, like there's still plenty of stuff that like just sits in, you know, never to get fucking re-released again because like nobody gives a shit about it or, mm-hmm. um, there's rights issues. That's another big one where it's like, man, remember how great that, uh, soundtrack was for like, you know, movie X, Y, Z. That's why we can't watch it anymore. You know, cause like, you know, band X, Y, Z won't give the rights to it. So, and they don't want to cut that piece out cause it was integral to the movie. Um, yeah, there's just so many pieces that go into it that make it so difficult. Um, there's a really great article about Grizzly 2 on The Ringer. So check that out um, after you get done listening to this 12-minute rant of like film <laughs> that I'm going on right now. Um, this is probably longer than the whole entirety of um, The Bride of Frankenstein. Um, but like, <laughs> And just sort of look at like the painstaking process you know that films can go through uh it's it's pretty wild sometimes so sorry i didn't mean to hijack your podcast there for no me. no 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 that was super oh, interesting dude. so <laughs> but it's not editing yes i was like the tangents are always the best part so so you're welcome there you go. about that <laughs> now this was some things that that we talked about obviously when we when we did the the frankenstein episode um 
But I think they, they covered a little bit more in, in this film with this whole idea of humanity uh, and the binary of good and bad. Um, mm. But I think when they have this, you know, this, this, I don't even want to say a competition between Pretorius and, and Frankenstein, but Pretorius kind of goading Frankenstein into doing this um, because he, he's taken advantage of this, this idea that he is a man of science and he wants to learn more and he's already unlocked some secrets. So how far can he go or how much further can he go? Um, but I believe the, his, would be wife makes the comment of like, oh, you know, there's some things we shouldn't know. There's some things that we should just kind of be left uh, to to curiosity. We really don't want to know about eternity. We won't, don't want to know about death. And this is the time of the film when when I didn't other otherwise. This is the one time I agree with Frankenstein, where you do want to know. And I think that's that's one of the the things when we talk about ghost movies or at least this belief in ghosts and things like that, um, and and even holding on to to organized religion. There's this hope that there is something, uh, and the the reason why you're searching it for it is because you want to prove that it exists, as opposed to, oh shit, we're doomed for all eternity. <laughs> like when we die, it's like a, a it's like a computer turning off or shutting down. Um, but I think they, they, they delve a little bit deeper into uh, some of the existential stuff. They, they get a little bit deeper when it comes to this idea of, of, of loneliness and the fact that, you know, now Frankenstein and Pretorius have, have a pair or at least have the completion of their pair with each other. And in their experiments, and they make, they make the assumption or at least the, the, uh, they have the understanding that the monster is lonely as well. So the best way to cure him, which again is a weird way to look at this, the best way to fix him is to create a pair bond for him, to create a friend for him. Um, which again, they they go with creating a woman for him as opposed to just another sentient being, you know, regardless of gender. It's like, let's go ahead and create a woman for you, which we've talked about this on some other episodes, but what is the purpose in creating a woman for him? Are you hoping that these two dead beings or, or these two reanimated beings are going to uh, kind of like an army of the dead start fucking? I mean, like, like what, what, what's I, I the, like what's the end game? I feel like that's the logical co- conclusion is that you want to see if these guys can get it on and make like little, um, you know, dead baby Frankensteins or something like that. Um, or, but, but that even shows like his ignorance of it, right? Uh, as yeah. far as Frank, Frankenstein or Pretorius, because the monster or the being, I guess being would be better. Uh, the being makes a friend with that blind guy. Yeah. With, with the visually impaired guy who's playing music, who then teaches him how to talk. <laughs> you know, it's you, you, you have this moment where he has a friend, he had, he's no longer lonely. Uh, the only thing that screws it up is the other people that show up and, and, and ruin kind of this harmonious link that he's created um, mm-hmm. because the, the, the blind man in the hut does not give a damn about him being a monster. He doesn't care. It's like somebody else I can, I can uh, spend my days with somebody I can talk to somebody I can, uh, you know, who I can share company with somebody who wants to listen to me play my violin. Mm-hmm. And that was a huge takeaway for me because they're spending all this time trying to make him a friend because they can't personally grasp that another human would want to be friends with him. Right. And then we see it happen. Like, like we're literally handed it happening. And if everyone had just left them alone, these two both get a friend and they're both happy. And instead it's like, uh, it's like the doctors are like, Oh, he's angry. He just needs to get laid. You know? Right. 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 Which is a very, I, I guess, stereotypical way for guys to deal with shit. Right. Yeah. It's like, oh, you're stressed. Well, you need to go get laid. Oh, you know, you're 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 thinking too much about this. You need to go get some. Um, as opposed to kind of how we we really should be approaching the the, the issue, and that's maybe have a conversation, <laughs> have a it, meal, go yeah. for a walk. You know, not everything is solved by by uh, sexual intercourse. 
It's uh, the real answer is bottle it up deep inside so that you can ruin the country later. I think is the real answer. <laughs> find it out. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Yeah. Uh, no, I totally agree with that. Um, like it really does kind of go delve more into the humanity of the monster. Um, and, um, I never thought of it in terms of like them not conceiving that he could potentially have the capacity to like make friends or something like that. But that's a really uh, great takeaway. Um, and something that I think they sort of expand upon, um, in, the bride from like 84 or whatever that is um, that um, has like sting and um, has. Um, oh God. Uh, from uh, flash dance Beale. What's her name? Oh, Jennifer Beale. Um, full frontal nudity. Um, spoiler alert. Um, and, uh, but the thing that I really liked about that one is that um, the monster like um, ends up, making a friend with a um like a dwarf um that um he meets through like a traveling circus um i don't know if you guys have ever seen the the bride um it's actually a pretty decent it's like super um very stylish right that that would be like the uh the most um like the easiest way to uh, sort of like um sort of sum it up all, you know, like in a nice tidy package or whatever. Um, but, uh, it has a really great cast and, um, not a bad time. Uh, I, I, I take a look at it. Maybe she's definitely a, a bigger part of that movie than, uh, the bride is in this one. That's for sure. Okay. Well, there's something else here in, in to, to, to bring it back to the bride, uh, when she is created, right. Mm-hmm. You see this, well, I have I have a couple of problems <laughs> with yeah, it. Yeah, go for it. Uh, one, because you you kind of see how the studio gets involved with this, where, um, or at least just just the male gaze gets involved because mm-hmm. they make the bride attractive. Oh yeah, I mean, especially in comparison to uh, the creature. Right. Yeah. Because he is seen as so grotesque that when people see him, they're repelled, right? Which makes sense right. that, that he makes friends with with a, a visually impaired man. Because right. all these other people, all they see is a monster, right? Whereas right. you see her and you're like, holy shit, she's kind of hot. Yeah, uh, the bride is a smokestack for sure, man. Uh, you're like, and, wow, even the hair, that's, 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 that's fashion forward. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, those bandages are uh, draped quite um, flat. Yeah. Around. On yeah. you, um, you, you corpse woman, you. <laughs> this, that, I, that is. Some, I'm glad you brought this up because, like, I think ultimately, deep down, the real um, lesson that you learn from the Bride of Frankenstein is you might fuck a dead girl. That's what I'm saying, man. Because, like, that is absolutely a a, a totally re- reasonable response from this movie. That's all I'm saying. I didn't mean to go completely dark. Did I ruin the whole podcast? <laughs> no, 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 not no, at no, all. No. Because that's, <laughs> didn't I? in all honesty, I guarantee you that's what people were thinking when they watched this oh, movie yeah. in, in 35 or even, you know, later on. It wasn't like, oh, she's grotesque and she's dead. It's, oh my gosh, she's so beautiful. Like she's, she's hot. I'm, I, you know, I, I, I need to talk to my girlfriend about getting a hairstyle like that or my wife to get a hairstyle like that. That's, that's awesome. Um, whereas, you know, she, she looks very feminine, very curvy, um, and the creature looks like a big fucking block. Like yeah. he, he there, he's just a big, massive being, uh, that, that is supposed to be intimidating and scary. And, and when she sees him, you know, she hisses and screams and all that stuff. And the, the creature, and I, I made sure to write this down, said, she hate me like yeah. others. Yeah. And if you don't have any feelings for the creature at that moment, you have no heart because he's already been isolated so much. Right. Yeah. He finds one person to get along with that he can live with. Who's taught him. Who's, who's brought out his humanity. Right. Right. And the person that gets created for him doesn't like him. 
Like that's her sole purpose was to be created for him. Yep. Yeah, no, um, I know. Like it's, um, it does really have some things to say, you know, about, and, uh, poor Boris Korloff, you know, um, looking like, uh, he got like hit in the face with a sledgehammer, you know, and then, um, you know, it, but it's the classic story of, uh, you know, like a three, you know, going for a 10, you know, and like just being shot down in flames. I think it's really, you know, what really is kind of going on there. So just man up a little bit, Frankenstein, you know, ex- accept your, your limitations, go out and find a different undead girl for you. Who's maybe not a 10, who's maybe like a seven, you know, um, you know <laughs> and you work on your personality a little bit, you know. Um, hey, he's make, made amazing he, strides since the last right, one. Right, exactly. So. Yeah, in like, uh, like a, a week. Months, right? You know, like he's going to be a fucking distinguished gentleman in like another six months after this. So, hey. I want to see that film. Work well, he's going to be put on the Ritz, too. Yeah, exactly. Work on yourself. Here's what I say. Work on yourself, Frankenstein. You should always be working on Frankenstein's monster, whatever you want to say. Work on yourself, right? Make yourself better and then find yourself a nice mermaid girl, you know, like, <laughs> else. um, or, um, you know, like a half werewolf girl or something like that. Um, that's just, you know, not quite, she's she not quite the, the half moon. Of, yeah, she, exactly. You know, she's not quite the bride of Frankenstein, but she's pretty, she's pretty good. Right. And she, you're still punching out of your weight class, uh, here, you know, and, uh, nobody's going to look at you. Everybody, actually, everybody's going to look at you and go, why is that girl with Frankenstein's monster? Oh my God. You know, and you can walk around and go, Hey, look, look at me, girl. She liked me good. You know, or what, whatever. Um, <laughs> she liked me for personality. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For like health. She liked me for healthy reasons, you know? Um, <laughs> but, like, let's get to that point. Brian, this is the part of the show where we kind of tell people, Hey, if you liked this film, what else should they watch? And normally I would let the guests go first, but mm-hmm. between Don's 212 recommendations and how many you're going to have, I'm going first because I just do a double feature and this one's super fucking easy because it's the same yeah. as last week. Frankenstein and, and Bride of Frankenstein go together, watch them together. That That's it for me. Brian, you're up. Did you not watch the movie? Because apparently they don't go together. Yeah, they don't go together very well at all, actually. They do. Uh, Trust me. Yeah. So um, The Bride, um, which I uh, mentioned earlier, um, I honestly don't think there's a lot of really good Frankenstein um, like adaptations, to be honest with you. So uh, I'm going to go a little more um, like low key and say everybody should watch the Spanish version of Dracula because it is a thousand times better than the English version of Dracula it was shot on the exact same sets. Um, like they shot it, uh, overnights, right? So like the, uh, the English version language would wrap at 7 PM or whatever. The Spanish language version would come in and like go from like 7 PM to 7 AM. And then the English version would come in and they'd shoot it again. Right. You know? And so it was just like a rotating, um, and, um, the Spanish version of Dracula is so much better than Bela Lugosi, uh, mainly because like. Um, I don't have to wonder what the fuck um, the Spanish version is saying. I have the nice translation right there for me. Um, (laughs) Plus, my Spanish is not terrible. You know, I've sort of noticed as I've gone over the, you know, like 25 years of or whatever of living in Phoenix and, you know, picking up the language has like brushed up my Spanish a little bit. Um, So like, um, you know, if you understand Spanish, then you can understand what Dracula is saying. Uh, versus if you understand English, you might be able to understand what uh, Bela Lugosi is saying. Um, you know, like I, I've never quite been able to understand what Bela Lugosi is saying. Um, but yeah, I would say the uh, the Spanish version of Dracula is very good. And it's probably a movie that none of your listeners have ever heard of, um, even in a thousand years. Um, and then if we're going to go like, so let's bring it modern day, right? Um, yeah. And go Universal Monsters. Um, the new uh, Invisible Man is so fucking good. Uh, oh, like yeah. I, cannot, I cannot reiterate this enough. It was the um, the gaslighting movie that I didn't know that I needed, um, and like I was so fucking impressed with that movie. Uh, it was the last movie that I saw 
before like all this shit happened, right? You know, when mm-hmm. we all thought, oh right. yeah, I'm going to be able to go see a movie in a week, you know, because like the world's not going to fucking end. Um, yeah, people will do the right thing. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Oh, this will, I mean, they're saying six weeks, right? Six fucking weeks. It'll be great. Um, and so, yeah, meanwhile, everybody's like PTSD over here um, afterwards, um, and we're still not even through it yet. So, um, so yeah, I'll say uh, that is uh, very good as well. Um, and, um, you know, like if you like the silliness, the, um, I would say the first Abbott, I think it's Evan Costello meet Frankenstein. Uh. <laughs> and I like, I like that one. They, they, it's like diminishing returns as it goes along, but like that one has, uh, I think it has Frankenstein, Dracula and the Wolfman and it has, um, Karloff and, um, Lon Chaney. It's a different Dracula though. I think if I'm not mistaken. So, um, I would recommend all those. And like, I know, um, a lot of the old universal ones are playing on Peacock right now. So um, you can get it for either like free or very cheap. Very cool. All right, Don, what do you got for us? All right. I'm going to start you off with uh, a couple of, I guess, gems. Uh, definitely Little Shop of Horrors. Uh, either version. Well, I guess yep. they're going to be three now. Uh, there'll be a third one. Um, the Bride of Chucky. Oh, yeah. Stepford Wives, the original or the remake. Yeah. Um, Brother from Another Planet. Oh, God, it's so good. So, uh, finally, somebody else has heard of the movie. <laughs> yeah. I'm, uh, I, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, come on, man. You know, that's, Brian has heard of every uh, movie. That's not fair. Okay. That's, well, we're going to test it out now because I'm going to mention one that I've only met one other person who's seen this movie, and that is Rat Boy. Uh, Rat Boy, I've never heard of. So. Oh, there we go. I got him. All yeah. right. <laughs> God, you guys uh, work so it's, hard it's, to it's, prove me wrong. But it is possible. Uh, Edward Scissorhands, uh, which I think we might have mentioned. Um, and just because I didn't mention it last time, uh, well, whatever movies I mentioned during Frankenstein, uh, the <laughs> Frankenstein episode. Uh, but I'm also going to mention Young Frankenstein. Oh, oh come yes. on, just say it. There was there was no disclaimer on this one. Young Frankenstein. <laughs> That's your payoff for two weeks of episodes. Good work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a great one. Uh, the Monster Squad's another one that just popped into my head. So if you've never seen that one, that one's a fun one. It touches on a lot of the Universal Monsters. Yes, it does. And it actually humanizes, or I should say it humanizes the creature in the same way that this film does. Yep. Which is great. I, yeah. Because I always love Gilman, and he is sort of like one character that they always kind of just portray as being unredeeming. And uh, if we know anything, um, not only is Gilman um, probably the best of the uh, Universal Monsters, but he is uh, Oscar worthy, and uh, he can he can get he can get some, you know, because like you know we saw the Shape of Water, we know what's going on. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> I didn't know if you guys had more. So um, so I guess that brings it back to you, Brian. You want to tell our listeners one more time where they can listen to your podcast and anything else you want to push? So um, my um, movie podcast is Yes Movies. Um, and you can get that everywhere where podcasts are available. Uh, I also have a football podcast called The No Huddle Offensive um, that okay. is now in seven season shit i don't fucking know a lot long but we just went we just passed five years on bs movies um so oh, that's um, awesome. it's certainly longer than that um i mean i've like at this point i produced over a thousand pot i think i've produced over a thousand podcasts at this point and i've certainly co-hosted probably closer to like 1500 at this point oh my god um you know like Uh, I was talking to this producer at uh, Phoenix Film Festival and I won't like, you know, like go into super craziness or anything. It's not a name anyway. Um, But, uh, you know, I was I was talking to him and I was like, I really like your movie a lot. Um, You know, do you have distribution? They're like, oh, yeah, we do. And I'm like, great. I'll follow back around with you. I have a podcast. And they were like, you have a podcast? 
And I'm like, I'm a middle-aged white guy in America. I was fucking <laughs> fun with the podcast. Are you fucking kidding? They're just like, what do you like to talk about? Movies. Here's your fucking podcast. All right. Thanks, man. I appreciate that, it. That that's nice. how I got this one. I know, right? You know, it's, yeah. people think, oh, like, uh, what did you do to get this podcast? They just assigned it to me. I didn't do anything. They're just like, do you like talking about movies? Yeah, I do. All right. Well, here, make 600 episodes of this. All right. I guess I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> what do I have to do that's better with my time? So, um, and um, yeah, that sort of like sums it up, I guess. So, <laughs> I, pro- awesome. I program movies at Film Bar, um, and uh, yeah, and uh, I'm uh, a great podcast guest. You should have me, like any podcasts. I, I think uh, you know at this point you've had me on um, three, four, five times. I don't know. Uh, certainly not the most. You know, I, I know that I can never quite. Yeah, so I'm not going to be on your podcast like 39 fucking times to break the record or whatever the fuck it is. Yeah, so, Thomas. Yeah, exactly. Was it was it really 39? Uh, last week was his 40th episode. <laughs> <laughs> right, <exactly. laughs> so, okay, cool. Uh, so yeah, uh, you are your uh, your your record is safe, buddy. Uh, I'm more than willing to uh, be a. A well-regarded uh, episode of podcast uh, guest that uh, you've had on many times. I will settle for that. Yeah. Um, but if other podcasts wanted to have me on, God, it just feels like I love to talk about movies. And um, as you can see, I can I can do it for a very long time. I mean, is it? Oh yeah. All right. So this is uh, definitely this is longer than the Bride of uh, Frankenstein. At this point, can no longer be a. Uh, a a special feature on the pod uh, on the uh, the Blu-ray of the 8K, uh, so we're gonna have to cut five minutes out of this. Um, <laughs> games. So find, find the shittiest five minutes and cut that shit out. All right, that's everything I said. Perfect. Oh, Jesus. all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I suppose that wraps it up for this week. So Brian, thank you for coming back once again and for doing this film. So yeah, yeah, welcome many times. Uh, I'll come back again and uh, we'll talk about some other movie and uh, I'll have a, a nice 10 minute rant about some other random shit for that too. Perfect. All right. So as always, I am James Sabata. And I'm Don Guillory. And we will see you next week here at the Necronoma.com. Oh.